I would like to extend a warm welcome to all members of the Planning Committee, officers and members of the public in attendance at today's meeting. I am Councillor Christine Ward, Chairman of the Planning Committee. I would now like to hand over to Democratic Services to read the housekeeping notes. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm today, but if there is a fire alarm, please leave the building immediately by the nearest exit and wait at the fire assembly point by the garages. Um, do not lose the lift. Um, please remember to turn your microphone on when to speak and then turn it off again. These obviously are new microphones, so please be aware that they pick up a lot more than they have done previously. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have two apologies, please. We've received apologies from Councillors Glass and Holding. I'd now like to um, have your um, vote on the, the minutes of the 8th of March. Those in agreement, please raise their hands. Thank you. They've been accepted. Thank you very much. And now can I have declarations of interest? Councillor Corbridge. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm to declare an interest in application 11415 Riverside Bath Road. Um, I am a Livington Pennington Town Councillor. I don't sit on the planning committee um, and I haven't discussed this application but I have been to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kangarani. I have an uh, uh, interest in application 221386. 3739 Salisbury Road in Totten. I'm not a member of the planning committee in, in um, Totten, and I have not been in discussion about this application at all. Thank you very much. Are there any more? Councillor Crisell. Thank you. I'm on the same planning, um, I'm not on the planning committee in Totten, but it's 2211386. Councillor Wade. Uh, a question, Chairman. As NFDC is the applicant in one of these applications, do we not all have to declare an interest? No. Would you like to explain that, Karen? Or No, it, it goes without saying that you don't need to declare an interest oh. in that. Thank you. We'll now move on to the agenda. So our first agenda item is the Pilgrim Inn, Hythe Road, Marchwood. Application number 22 stroke 11364. And this is on page five of your agenda. Um, could you please go ahead with the presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so this application is for a suite of advertisements on an existing public house. Um, there are a number of advertisements on the property already, so this is uh, basically a refreshment of a number of advertisements on the site. There are two new signs going up as well, so we'll discuss that in a second. Um, that's just to give you a bit of an idea of where we are. Um, so there are a number of existing um, signs already on the building, um, so there's going to be a, a suite of refurbishment and replacement uh, painted signs on the building. and. Uh, other minor amendments. Uh, there is an existing um, freestanding hanging sign in this location already, and they're just replacing the, the sign itself, not the post. Uh, and then there's two new freestanding signs, which is this sign here on this plan, um, that are going in on either end of the site. Uh, as a quick update, uh, it was mentioned there was uh, an objection originally from Marchwood Parish Council. Um, there was originally an additional sign here, which has since been removed from the plans. Uh, following that removal and amendment of the plans, they were reconsulted and they have uh, withdrawn their objection to the scheme. Um, so just to give you some additional context. Uh, there are some downlighting on these signs. You can see there, there's some downlighting on that sign there and up on here. This sign already does have some degree of illumination, but they're just uh, refreshing the, the sign itself. Uh, so just to give you, these are some illustrative images provided by the applicant about what the, um, the new proposal will look like. And then this is some just images of the existing property. You can see there is some existing uh, signage on the building itself. 
there will be one new sign, one of the freestanding signs coming in here. And then as we move further up the street, there'll be another one at the opposite end of the site. This is that hanging sign that's going to be replaced there. Um, and then just in terms of, uh, there'll be a new, uh, again, refreshing of the signage in this location uh, and some of the other features of the site. Uh, so as outlined in the report, um, there is additional lighting on the site and there is obviously some additional signage. We felt that the scope of the signage was appropriate in the uh, commercial context of the site um, in terms of uh, advertising and making sure that people are aware as they're approaching the site that there is an entrance there and that uh, uh, there is a public house to be used. Uh, so we've recommended approval. Um, highways have raised no objection in terms of uh, the illumination and the potential impacts and distraction from that point of view. So from those points of view, we think we've covered off the, um, the potential issues of objection and we've recommended approval. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any speakers. Are there any questions for the officers? No questions. We're going to debate. Councillor, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's just a comment, really, Chairman. Um, the Parish Council were concerned about the illumination on this site, but I'm pleased to see that... But I'm pleased... I did press it. But I'm pleased to see that um, there is condition number seven, which is going to... Um, have control over the illumination on the site. So um, with that in place, um, the Parish Council are satisfied, uh, and so am I. Thank you, Chairman. Any more comments? Councillor Wade. Chair, um, I propose we accept the officer's recommendation. Councillor Corbridge. Happy to second that. Members, in that case, we'll go to the vote. So the recommendation is to grant, and that's been proposed by Councillor Wade, seconded by Councillor Corbridge. All of those in favour, please vote. Our next application is 22 stroke 11415, Riverside, Bath Road, Lymington. This is on page 13 of your agenda. We have one gentleman here, Mr. Malcolm Thomas, who is an objector. So we'll go back to um, John Fanning, if you can do the presentation for us, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so this application um, is uh, down in Limington. We've got, uh, it's within the King Sultan Conservation Area. Um, the application follows a previous grant of consent um, for an extension to the property. Uh, however, unfortunately, the development wasn't uh, carried out in accordance with the details of that consent um, and uh, has been uh, now finished uh, not in, the, in accordance with those details. So this current application seeks to try and uh, regularise the existing situation on the site um, by amending the, the details of the previous application. Um, that's just to give you a bit of context on the, the layout of the surrounding area and where we are. Um, so this is the building as it was prior to the application which was granted consent. Um, the consent that was granted basically uh, gave permission for extending this part of the building here and putting a flat roof first floor level extension into this part of the property. Um, some things I'll draw your attention to is this existing arrangement with the window. Um, this was, as I said, how the property was originally laid out. Uh, there will be a, a photo a bit later in the slide just to uh, hopefully give you a bit of a clearer idea on what this all looks like. So what we've got here, the plans on the left are the consented scheme. You can see there that we've got this uh, extension being brought across and this first floor element being put in here with a flat roof, uh, infilling that part of the building. Now, as constructed, there is a segment cut out of the building here. 
Uh, there have also been a number of amendments to the uh, window layout. Uh, so there's this window here, it's obviously a different uh, form. And then uh, we had uh, two windows here, which again, slightly different in form. The conditions on the previous application uh, required the windows serving uh, this bathroom to be obscurely glazed and on opening 1.7 meters from the floor of the room that they serve. Um, the internal arrangement has been changed slightly. So you can see originally this window was cut in half by this bathroom wall. Uh, this window has been, that wall's been pushed back. So there's a bit more, more um, corridor space here. Um, in terms of how the actual property has been implemented as well, there have been a number of changes. So again, uh, so previously these windows were conditioned to be obscured. Um, as implemented, this window is not obscured. This window has a uh, slight glazing and this window has a more um, uh, uh, opaque glazing uh, and both of these windows are openable. Um, so as we've, uh, I'll just run through uh, some of the photos to try and give a better idea. This is the building as it originally stood. Um, so you can see there that, that window with the zigzag nature in this uh, thing. Uh, this is the property and some of the context as it stands. Um, so you can see you've got that cut out balcony, these windows here. And this is the relationship with the neighbor over there. Um, one of the issues we have is there is a objection to the scheme from our conservation team. They were concerned about the material finish on the property. Um, as laid out in the report, uh, we thought the standard was to an acceptable quality, but that's obviously something that, having seen the photos, you can make an assessment uh, on yourselves. Um, this is just to give a bit of context on the windows. Um, so this is that unobscured window that I was talking about. This is that more partially obscured window, both looking out towards the neighbour. Uh, this is the fully obscured uh, window in the bathroom looking to the rear. Uh, the balcony has in, uh, been installed with a, a Juliet balcony rail to prevent people from stepping out onto the balcony. Uh, and one of the conditions of the consent uh, requires that that to be uh, maintained uh, in accordance with these details. Um, there is uh, some concerns from local residents about additional overlooking. Um, there was an additional existing window uh, which sort of had a, a regular sort of more window, uh, regular form in this location. Um, our view is that the additional uh, sort of lower level uh, part of this didn't really add any additional overlooking compared to what you would normally get from just standing in that and looking out a window in that location, which was that existing feature anyway. Um, so for the reasons we've outlined in the report, uh, we felt that the additional harm from uh, potential overlooking didn't really rise to the level where we'd be looking to refuse the application uh, when compared to the existing uh, design of the site before the works were commenced. Uh, and the, the quality of the works were done to an acceptable standard, so we didn't feel that the conservation area was being harmed as a result of the development. Um, but obviously you can uh, make a decision yourselves having had a look at that, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one speaker, Mr. Malcolm Thomas, who's objecting. You have three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my name is Malcolm Thomas. Um, I live at Ferry View, which is next door to Riverside. Unfortunately, you won't find Ferry View on your block diagram, as this block diagram is some 25 years out of date. Um, the alterations that have actually been made bear no relation to the permission granted in June 2022. The application went through unopposed by any of Riverside's neighbours, as it was a small extension for an upstairs bathroom. What I do object to is the addition of a full-length bifold door leading out onto a newly constructed first floor flat roof terrace. None of the construction was applied for before it was built. This is also the same plan that was withdrawn previously when every neighbour around objected to it on the grounds of it being intrusive and overlooking us. This seems to have been an attempt to bring back this plan, but by the back door. Uh, I'd like to um, just say that previ the previous owner in 2016 uh, had a, an application approved and he had the neighbours in to look at it before he, uh, he um, put it in for approval uh, and he wanted, amongst other things, a window to bring some light into the back of the room upstairs. 
this win window was, as he explained, at head height, so that you actually had to go up to it to look out, and that it was just for light. What we have now, and I'd like to read the officer's report, a portion of it, the, odd, the original development and approval scheme included an existing rear-facing window in this location, and therefore the only additional glazing would be at a lower level, and this isn't considered to be substantially increasing any practical overlooking. What we have, what we had, was a, a window at head height. What we have now is four bifold doors, ceiling to floor, which gives a panoramic view of neighbours on both sides and in the <coughs> rear from any part of the room, which is totally different to um, the officer saying it isn't considered substantially increasing and practically overlooking. Uh, moving on to the, uh, the plan for the Juliet balcony, I'm told that the terrace will not be used. However, the potential is there, and it only leads for a couple of bolts to be removed to bring the roof into use. Why have doors there in the first place if they're not to be used for access to the flat roof? This is also, there is also a cupboard built into the roof void, which can only be accessed from the other side of the Juliet balcony on the flat roof. Uh, and finally, ignoring the problem of the flat roof terrace, the view from the bifold doors, as they currently are, is still obtrusive and overlooking the surrounding neighbours and, and are, sorry, and we all therefore lose our privacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions? Um, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Chairman. Um, would I be right in saying this is a retrospective um, planning permission? Because it looks, sounds to me as if this was built to nothing like what was agreed. So therefore, it's got to be a retrospective, but it doesn't seem to have anything like that within the planning um, information. Um, so I query that, and my other query is, um, I think there is a, an overlooking element in there, and the neighbours have been totally ignored, and I think that's completely wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sevier. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, it's a question to the officer. The objector said that what has now been built is what was refused before, if, if that is the case. So basically, what he's saying is that what has been built is what was refused. So they have not built... Up. So I just wanted to confirm that is the case, that the, we, the, it had been turned down originally, but they had just ignored it and built. Thank you. Uh, so there was originally an application uh, submitted prior to the 22-10345 application. That application was withdrawn, it wasn't refused. So uh, that application did seek permission for a uh, balcony in this location, um, but there were concerns about the overlooking impact. Obviously the, the proposal we've got in front of us at the moment has a Juliet balcony rather than a full balcony with stepping out onto it. Uh, and we've got a condition to secure against that, which is uh, sort of why we've deemed that to be acceptable. Um, I did outline in the report, I do think a, a balcony that you could step out onto in this location would be harmful. Uh, if the Juliet balcony or the condition that we've got was removed or uh, contravened, then we would uh, potentially be looking at taking enforcement action in that regard because uh, we do agree with neighbours that there is, if there was the potential for stepping out onto this area, that there would be potentially a harmful increase in overlooking. Um, one of the things I would just uh, sort of highlight, you can see there, the, this is this consented window in that location. Um, and that was that original window you can see there. Um, so that window went down to the level of that roof, where it comes up to the building. Um, you can see that there. That's that existing arrangement. Uh, so if we just flip over to... Uh, you can sort of see the level where that would come in. So that's, that's that level. Uh, just to give an indication of what the outlook is and how that arrangement works. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Benison. 
thank you, Chairman. Two questions to uh, Mr. Thomas, if I may. Uh, Mr. Thomas, first of all, could you tell me which is your property on our plan? I've got uh, Solent Cottage or Waterford Cottage, which is yours. Sorry, as I said, it's 25 years out of date. Um, you will see, I think, on your plan, a thing called a surgery. Yes. Which was my father-in-law's surgery. Um, we have now um, got planning permission to turn it into a house, which we did 20-odd years ago, and it's called Ferry View. And it's not the same footprint as the surgery shown there. Okay, okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, in your piece, you mentioned didn't quite catch it, something about there had been um, the other side of the balcony, a cupboard or something already built in. Could you just explain that a bit more? Yes, <coughs> on, on the, there's the Juliet balcony. The other side of the Juliet balcony on the flat roof is a cupboard built into the void. The only way to get to that cupboard is over the Juliet balcony. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't uh, observe that when I was on site. Uh, you can have a look there. Yeah. Councillor Benison, what were you referring to? On, on, yeah, if you'd just like to. Question two. Yeah. To offset, if I may. Um, if you, Oh, that's the picture. Um, I, I thought there was, I think it's the hinges of the Juliet balcony. I thought that was a, an, a, some sort of an opening there. But presumably, it's those two side pieces you're saying. Yeah, it's on the other side. It's on the other side. Okay, which seems a little odd. Was, uh, were you not aware that there was some construction the other side of the Juliet balcony? Uh, I mean, I haven't. I, I didn't see that, no. Um, I mean, I would say... I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what's being referred to here, exactly. Uh, Chairman, could we perhaps see the photograph of the other side of the Juliet balcony? Just there, yes, you can see the outline of the door. Yes, I mean, whilst I appreciate there may be some storage area available under that slope, you know, in terms of the, the issues we're looking at, we really are overlooking predominantly on this issue, and I don't think that would cause rights when you're overlooking. The ability to access that cupboard would be a problem for the householder. We believe we have a condition that prevents that from being used as amenity area, which would stop that overlooking occurring. Does that answer all your questions, Councillor Benison? Are there any are there any more questions? Okay, I'm going to take some legal comments. Sorry, just just two things, um, Mr. Thomas. I think referred to the ordnance survey extract being out of date. Members will observe it's actually copyright 2023. It is the up to date OS sheet. It's just that the OS only update. Uh, sections of the plan when there when there's a certain amount of change obviously that one change in itself hasn't been enough for them to update it so um, no I think no criticism attaches to the officers on that point point. Uh, and secondly um, it's been mentioned that this is a retrospective application that's entirely correct but um, nothing turns on that in and of itself the question you have to ask yourself is, is the development as now built acceptable in planning terms? So uh, you should not attach <laughs> any weight to the fact that it's retrospective. Is this another question, Councillor Hawkins? I'd like to question the... the... Okay. 
um, a retrospective order is a rule of planning. And, and as rules of planning, they've got to be adhered to. Why is all of a sudden retrospective orders aren't being adhered to? They should, people should be fined for building property that's not <coughs> adhering to the plans that have been approved. Now, this is why we get this going on. And the only way to stop it is find them and then look at their new um, application. Because otherwise, they're just taking the mickey and slicing the planning rules and regulations with a, a, a sharp knife. I'm sorry, Councillor, that, that's simply not correct. They, it, failing to comply with plans is not in and of itself an offence. The, you, you can only be fined if the local authority issues an enforcement notice and you fail to comply with the enforcement notice. Now, it's a separate issue for you as members whether you want to issue an enforcement notice. But if you wanted to issue an enforcement notice, you would still have to ask yourself the question, is it expedient to take, to take enforcement action? And what that means is you ask yourself, would I grant planning permission for this if an application was before me? So I repeat, the fact that it's retrospective, it, nothing turns on that point at all. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Councillor Crizel. It's not a question, but I would like to um, enforce what you've just been speaking about. I think it should be a, a, against the law and that there should be a fine in the future. It isn't, so it can't be taken into consideration. If there are no more questions, we'll go to debate. Councillor Kangarani. Uh, thank you. Uh, how do breach going to be enforced if the neighbour has to complain to if the if if the if the, the um, applicants find themselves going into the roof occasionally, and then obviously being have to be have to be spotted first, don't they? Somebody had to look at them, and somebody write a letter of complaint, and they said, "Don't break the rule." Without that, you can't take any action, can you? Uh, so, yeah, the, the methodology for enforcement is usually uh, it will get referred to us. Um, our enforcement officers will then take account of any evidence they can either gather or is provided to them. Um, there will be a decision as to uh, the expediency and of enforcement action. Um, do we think uh, harm is being caused? And if we can think we can demonstrate harm is being caused, then we'll be looking at serving, uh, in this case, it would like to be a breach of condition notice and uh, the sort of process goes from there. Just, just to follow up on that, uh, obviously then uh, the neighbours have to keep watching this building 24-7 or have a camera looking into that property all the time to see whether somebody is breaching the law. Uh, to me, it obviously is very difficult to monitor that. Uh, is that something that we can put another condition that to put the building where it was? Yeah, I appreciate the enforcement of such planning conditions is difficult and does, as with many planning conditions, require third parties to monitor it. You know, access, we only have access to public land on, on a daily basis. And so we would require evidence from neighbours that it was being used in this way. And then we would make an assessment of that and then go through the enforcement process. But yes, there's, we would not be having somebody there 24-7, you know, looking for people walking onto the balcony, and we would rely upon being notified by third parties with evidence. Would the neighbours put the camera pointing at that window all the time? To that's, that's beyond, uh, beyond I'm, I'm the I'm just planning. saying that would be breach, shouldn't it? Yeah, that, that's a, a separate issue. Councillor Wade. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we've got a question for the officers. Uh, taking into account the legal advice, uh, the fact that uh, it, our officers have recommended grant subject to conditions. Uh, if we were to uh, uh, decline this application, would the uh, applicant have a strong case for appeal, uh, being it is a res retrospective uh, application? Uh, so, obviously, um, if, if I thought that we would... Uh, uh, lose an appeal, then my recommendation would probably be different. Um, the, uh, from my point of view, the, in taking into account the planning merits, my opinion as a professional officer is that the application should be granted. 
Um, obviously, as part of that assessment, I'm looking at wider case law and uh, the assessment that I think a planning inspector would make on a judgment. So I suspect my, my opinion as a planning officer is that an inspector would make a similar judgment. Um, obviously, uh, that is something that uh, can be tested, but uh, there, there are uh, potential risks associated with that as well. Yes. Are there any more questions? In that case, we'll go to debate. Councillor Sevier. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Oh, we all love retrospective, don't we? Um, can I say most of the retrospective we see are just changes in windows, very little else. Th this is very different, I feel. This is, this is really exceptional um, when it comes to that sort of thing. And my main concern is overlooking. The, the planning application that went through was to avoid overlooking. This is overlooking. And at the moment, unless somebody can persuade me, if it had just been a change of window, but this is something completely different and it's not as agreed by our planning department. So that's where I stand. I, I await um, other comments uh, to, before I make up my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Corbridge. Thank you very much. Um, so the main objections to this application, I'm going to set aside the retrospective issue because I know how we feel about that. Um, one is from the conservation um, point of view, the other is overlooking. Um, I have to say, I did take the opportunity to go and have a look at this one. Not something I do that often, but I did go um, in this particular instance, um, partly because of the views of my town council colleagues. I have to say, as far as the conservation issue is concerned, I know Bath Road well. It's an absolute hodgepodge of buildings. Um, there is no consistent style down there. I don't believe there's a, uh, there's a conservation issue. And as far as overlooking is concerned, um, I looked out of that win that, yes, on the, on the right-hand side. There's a very small amount of overlooking. And actually, what you can see from there is the edge of the pool in the neighbouring um, in the neighbouring garden, um, and I also think that there are very valid reasons. Although I don't agree with retrospective normally, there are very valid reasons why this applicant made those changes. Um, and I know they're not planning reasons, but he does have a very disabled son who's in a wheelchair all the time, and he's done it so that his son can see out. And I know that we're not allowed to consider those because they're not planning reasons, but um, they're important reasons. And I just wanted to say that because I think it might go a small way to explaining why he made the changes he made. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Right. Um, my main bug about this is the overlooking. Um, everybody is entitled to privacy. I know we're not entitled to light and all the bits and pieces that come, but we are entitled to our privacy when we've spent a lot of money on our home, doing a garden, putting a pooling and things like that. Um, all this business about, um, I think, legal said, if it came before you again, would you accept it? No, we didn't accept it in the first place. We, the approved plans were that it was going to be obscure glazed, and there was, we really went into the overlooking thing. So I don't see why we should allow it again. I, I think they can obscure some of that glass to allow a bit of privacy. I'm sorry somebody's in a wheelchair, but that doesn't help the neighbours who have got overlooking, and especially if there's a swimming pool in view. Um, I wouldn't like to be running around the garden knowing somebody was sitting there watching me. Not a pretty sight. But, um, no, I, I'm, I'm against this. I'm sorry. Thank you. Just for clarification, it wasn't refused. It was withdrawn last time. Right. Okay. Councillor Bellows. Yeah, thank you. Um, looking at this, I mean, it, it does look quite attractive. Um, 
but I can't understand why the original plans have been so deviated from um, and why another <coughs> application wasn't put in. But uh, it is there now, and actually I don't think the overlooking problem, looking at it, and the fact that my fellow councillor here has looked out that window, it doesn't look that, um, that bad. And I mean, yes, in an ideal world, we'd all love to live in areas where we're not overlooked. But I think a lot of us are overlooked. Um, yeah, I'm not happy with this at all, but I don't think we have got good grounds, unfortunately, to refuse it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Benson. Thank you, Chairman. I have to say I'm not entirely comfortable with this application. Um, I did um, get our case officer to forward to me yesterday the application that had been granted, that's 10345, which is the one on the left-hand side there, so that I could understand exactly what the, what the issues were um, and also looked at the application that was withdrawn. And to my mind, what has been built is very close to the withdrawn application uh, than it is to the granted application. Um, there is also this issue that the applicant has already built something the other side of the Juliet balcony, which I know is speculation as to what he might do with that. Um, and I am aware that there is a condition restricting the use of the flat area the other side of the balcony. But that, of course, will leave a forever enforcement issue for the council. So I'm in a little bit of a quandary, Chairman, as to quite how to uh, deal with this one, because from the public's perceptive, uh, perspective, sorry, um, what has been built is very much the same as the application that was withdrawn. And I understand there was um, a lot of objection to the application that was eventually withdrawn. So um, I find this quite difficult in, in uh, w what grounds we could find to um, actually refuse this application. Um, perhaps our case officer could assist in, in that. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd just like to say, though, that uh, we can't speculate, <laughs> speculate over what might happen to the flat roof. If it was used for anything permanent, it'd have to come back with a planning application. But I'll go to David anyway. I'm sorry, if I could, it was really some assistance with do we have any grounds that would stand up to refuse it as is, was my question. Yeah, um, you, you'll have heard from, from John, the case officer, that he believes strongly that there are no clear grounds for refusing this retrospective application. I think the issue, the key issue appears to be the extension of the window lower down and how we've got to demonstrate that that creates additional overlooking. I mean, I think that's really difficult to do because, you know, a window at, you know, sort of chest high level above is used to look out of and a lower window is the same. So we've got to demonstra demonstrate to an inspector that is increasing significantly overlooking of neighbours' properties. And also, you know, when you live in a row of premises, there is properties, there is an expectation, as most of us do, that there will be some overlooking of rears of, of the bottoms of your garden, and that's what's happening here. Councillor Servier again. Yeah, it's just on the overlooking, because I was thinking about the fact that if people walked out onto the flat roof, they would have a very much a panoramic view of all the surrounding gardens. And that's different from um, being in your downstairs, sitting on a chair, looking round, as opposed to being up on the up much higher and being able to see all the way round from there. But so that that's where my concern is: um, the potential of, of serious overlooking. Well, thank you, Councillor Wade. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we get it. We all don't like retrospective applications, but we must take the emotion out of this and look at this application in its own right. Um, I, I take the point about, that Chazza Sevier said about water on the flat roof, but that's not part of this application. This application is about the difference of a window being this high and higher, whatever it is. 
And yet the, the question is, is there more overlooking from the larger window than the smaller window? Uh, clearly, the officers, uh, uh, and of course, Councillor Corbett has been there to a degree, he doesn't see much, much overlooking. And looking at it logically, uh, one would tend to agree with that, that, that position. But we must look at this in, in, in its individuality. The difference really about this isn't the flat roof, because no one's going to walk on a... Well, I wouldn't like to walk on a flat roof, I might fall through it. So and it depends what it's made of. But that's not this application, it's about this window. And the question is, uh, is it going to be detrimental to the, to the, to the neighbouring uh, residents? Clearly, the, the, the resident thinks it will be. Um, the officers don't think it will be, and that's the crux of the matter. Who do you want, you want to go with? We, it would be very difficult, which is why I asked that question earlier, to go with an application that our officers have said there's no reason to refuse and to try and refuse it. Because looking at the logic, and I think that, 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 that David has said it really well, it, that, that the difference of what we've got to decide about. So I don't see how we cannot support the officers in, in this application. Councillor Kangarani. Um, obviously, there was a window, now the door. There's a change in material. Uh, would that be um, make the people a bit think, be more supportive if the the doors to be changed to windows and the bottom window not to be changed. We're not here to redesign. We're here no, to I'm look just at saying that in order, to, in order to stop the 24 7 monitoring of people uh, getting on that roof, w would that be a condition? Of what? They'll just no. make the half of the window. Do you want to go into that? Yeah, so when we apply conditions, there are a number of different tests we have to, to look at. and. Um, Fundamentally, one of the tests that we have to look at is, is that condition reasonable? Now, as it is, this, this application has been submitted for the development in front of us, and that's what we have to assess. Um, obviously, if, if we uh, refuse the application and we identify our reasons for refusal, the applicant might well look to come in with a new application to address those reasons for refusal if they think that's, that's the appropriate route, or they can obviously challenge that decision at appeal. Um, I don't think it would be reasonable of us to impose a condition to say that the development has to change I don't think we could, I don't think that would stand up. Is this another question, Councillor Corbridge, or do you want to go into debate? Well, we still, are, still seem to be asking questions, but Councillor Corbridge. Well, I'm not sure if I'm doing this at the right time now, but I'm actually going to propose that we um, approve this application in line with the case officer's recommendation. Um, I don't believe that there is a degree of overlooking that is harmful. I really don't. Um, and I can see no valid reason, um, apart from the re retrospective debate, which we've just kicked out, um, for, for turning it down. Excuse me, Chair. Um, should the objector have a one minute before we vote? No, I'm coming back. To oh, right. okay. I need Thank you. We'll now come back um, to the objector. You have one minute. Thank you, Chairman. Um, two points. Um, first of all, the uh, case officer has just said that the original window was chest high, which it wasn't. It was neck high, so you had to actually strain to look over it. That one there. It wasn't chest high. Uh, and second point, the councillor from Livington was saying that she'd been there and the only thing she could see was uh, into Solent Cottage's garden. I was in my garden yesterday, my, and there were three people on the Juliet balcony looking straight down at me into my uh, courtyard. It also looked straight down into Waterford's garden, so I'm not sure where you were looking. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. We'll now go to the vote. The recommendation is to grant, and that's been proposed by Councillor Corbridge and seconded by Councillor Brand. All of those in favour, please raise your hands.
and those against. And do I have any abstentions? One, Councillor Benison. Shall I just, sorry, sorry, just to clarify, you, you, you voted not to grant, you haven't yet voted to refuse, somebody needs to propose a reason to refuse. Who's proposing the refusal? We now have a proposal to refuse from Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Crizel. And can I have reasons, please? I need reasons, Councillor. All that's been said before. No. I, th I still think the um, overlooking thing is, is the main reason. Um, secondly, the approved plans were really nice. Why have they changed them? I just, it's all, we approved it, and now they've gone back to the one that they withdrew. It's, it's not right, I'm sorry. I don't know what else I've got to say. Um, What's legal? Mr Norris, would you like to help us out on this one? It's clear that the, the key issue for members is the overlooking. So, um, John and I have just had a quick chat, and we think that the wording could be along the lines of, Proposed changes to the rear window would result in an unacceptable le level of overlooking, contrary to the privacy and amenity of adjoining properties. Could we, could we also t uh, mention something about the flat roof and the p p p potential to use the flat roof? I, I do feel that is the that is the crux of it. I, I think if, if members wanted to use that for a reason, we, we believe it could be trolled through a condition. However, if members aren't satisfied, then we could say it would lead to an unacceptable potential for use of this area as... Yes, yes. Um, could we add in that it is not built as granted? That's the reason the application's here in the first place. That in itself is not a reason for refusal, as, as Nigel has explained. Okay. We go to the vote. Councillor Hopkins proposed refusal. Councillor Crizil seconded. And for the reasons that have been stated. Can you please raise your hands if you wish to refuse? Eight. And those against the reckon that refusal? Four, and Chair. Abstentions. One. Councillor Bellows. Uh, members, we'll have a break. If you can be back in the chamber at quarter past ten. Thank you. We continue with our next planning application, which is 37 to 39 Salisbury Road, Totten. Page 19 on the agenda. Application number 22 stroke 11386. I have um, speakers, Ms. Laura Brimson, who is planning agent, Mr. Tim Davis, the applicant, and available for questions, Mr. Paul Moss, the architect. So we'll go ahead with the presentation. And we have interests again, Oh, please. yeah. Do we have interests? Two. Can you say what the interests are? I'm a top and councillor, but I'm not on planning. Detail. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Judith. Over to you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, members. Um, you will have had some updates circulated uh, yesterday, um, a couple of plan updates to conditions 2 and 17. Um, as you know, the application is at the planning committee <coughs> because it's an NFDC housing development and also because of the town council and councillor objection. This is the ordinance survey plan of the site. The site is located on Salisbury Road. It has a frontage to the side and um, adjoins the access to the Westfield Road car park. There's commercial premises fronting the site. This is the, uh, the aerial photograph. There's some protected trees on the frontage. The southeast side of the site is set back from Salisbury Road where there are commercial and retail properties. This is a bungalow at number 41. This is the existing building on the site. This is a two-storey building that's currently va vacant, previously used as a drop-in centre. The remaining part of the site, which is number 39, is cleared of buildings and has been for some time. This is the proposed site layout plan. The proposal is to erect 20 flats on the site in two blocks. All of the flats will be for affordable housing. In accordance with policy, there would be an obligation attached to any consent to require um, policy compliant affordable housing to be retained on the site. Two blocks are proposed. Block A on the frontage is a three and a two and a half storey building. This would accommodate 12 flats. To the rear, block B is a two storey building for eight flats. In the centre of the site is a shared amenity space and to the frontage where there are existing protected trees would another, be another area of shared amenity space. There would be no car parking provided on the site. However, the site is located in a highly sustainable location adjoining Totten Town Centre, close to a wide range of facilities and also bus stops and the train station. In addition, as set out in the report, the applicant has agreed to make a financial contribution towards improving sustainable local and cycling and walking infrastructure in accordance with Hampshire County Council's recent policy. This area here is proposed to install drainage to serve the development. This is the proposed front elevation. This is the, large, the larger block A. This is a three and two and a half storey building. It has gable features and recessed central sections. The design steps back to a lower eaves height closest to the access road and to number 41. It has an articulated form and uses contrasting materials to help break up its scale and massing. It is set back relative to adjoining buildings and screened by the mature trees on the frontage. This is the west elevation of the building. This elevation would front the access to the car park and it would also be seen in views from Salisbury Road, albeit set back from it. This elevation has been reduced in terms of its um, impact and, uh, and massing by the use of the contrasting materials, recessed brickwork and the introduction of canopies and entrance to give interest to the street. This would face the, into the courtyard of Block A and this is the elevation facing east which would be only seen over the top of the existing commercial buildings. This is block B facing the car park. You can see the more domestic scale and two-storey form of this building. And this is the elevation facing into the courtyard. This plan shows external details and materials that would be used, demonstrating a high quality finish and design would be achieved. Um, these are set out on the slide, a, a use of red multi-stock bricks, dark green and black pre-weathered zinc, matching windows and rainwater goods. These details have been submitted to demonstrate the quality of the recessed windows and the way that the um, zinc would, would wrap around the roof. This is the proposed visual 
um, showing the proposed building within the existing street scene. And this is the, review, uh, the rear view. And I have some floor plans. This is the floor plan, ground floor of block A, first floor of block A, and I've identified on here the two flats that are closest to the western boundary of the site. The second floor of block A, first the ground floor of block B, and first floor of block B. This is the proposed landscaping plan. This provides a framework for the detailed planting scheme that will be secured by a planning condition. This shows how the boundaries will be treated, the retention of the mature trees and new tree planting with a hedge to Salisbury Road. The main issues in this application are set out in page 19 of your report. Some photographs of the application site from the frontage. Existing site context showing the setback of the building relative to the adjoining commercial properties. The application site in more, more long distance view, this tree here is on the frontage of the site, as is this one. Looking towards the access from the opposite side. And this is from the car park, looking towards the western boundary of the site. This is number 41, the adjoining bungalow on the opposite side of the access. And this shows the rear of the, of the site from the car park. This is the rear of number, four, of number 35, the commercial buildings adjoining the site. And this is the relationship between the existing number 37 that would be demolished. This is a photograph of the side elevation of number 41, showing a number of side windows and photographs from the side patio and the rear area of number 41. Here are some comparisons of the rear of existing and proposed views, existing and proposed, and from the front, existing and proposed. The recommendation is set out on this slide. The proposed development would make an important contribution to the provision of urgently needed affordable housing to meet local needs in the area and the wider New Forest District. The scale, massing and design of the building and layout are contextually appropriate within their setting and would be of the high quality. Important trees on the site would be retained and protected. Residential amenity of existing and future residents would not be adversely affected. A nil car parking scheme is acceptable. The site is in a sustainable town centre location close to local facilities, bus stops and Totten Town Centre. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to an obligation in relation to affordable housing provision, the identified habitat, air quality and monitoring contributions, completion of a legal agreement with Hampshire County Council to secure the highway contribution and conditions set out in the report. That's the end of the presentation, Chairman. Thank you very much. We'll come to our speakers. First of all, we'll come to Mr Tim Davis. You're going to split the three minutes. I believe you're going to speak for a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. My name is Tim Davis, and I'm here today as applicant on behalf of New Forest District Council's Housing Strategy and Development Team. With me is Laura Grimerson from Gillings Planning and Paul Moss from Architecture PLB. We are here to speak in support of the application and to answer any questions. The proposal before you today would result in the provision of 20 affordable homes in Totten on this previously developed site, which has remained vacant for a significant period of time. From the outset, our design brief aimed to achieve a sensitive balance where the setting and its neighbours would be respected, but where the scope to provide affordable housing could also be optimised given the sustainability of the location. During the design process, we have listened closely to the Council's planning officers, and as their reports and comments confirm, we are today presenting a proposal that is sustainable, functional, appropriate and attractive, and one in which the residential amenity of existing residents would not be harmed. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Laura Grimerson, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. This long-standing vacant site accommodates a tired and ageing building which is no longer fit for purpose. It's surrounded by hoardings and detracts from the overall character and appearance of the street scene in this prominent town centre location. 
This application seeks to address this by consolidating the two sites and delivering 20 much needed affordable homes in response to a local need, effectively reusing a brownfield site within the defined built up area of Totten, a location which is accepted as being accessible and sustainable. We have made notable design changes during the course of the planning application and these will be explained shortly. Um, whilst the main principles were accepted by officers on submission, including support for a taller building on this site frontage, amendments were requested to improve the proposal's relationship with the local context. This resulted in changes to provide a more balanced arrangement of windows, to improve the solid to void ratio, and to use a palette of materials that would be more appropriate for the local context. This includes the use of red brick and contemporary grey zinc cladding to refer to traditional materials in the surrounding area. Subsequent comments from officers confirm that the design will be considered as an attractive contemporary addition to the town. We're confident that, that the proposals respond well to the local character of Totten and that this site is an appropriate location for a landmark corner building. A zero parking scheme is appropriate here due to the sustainable location of the site and the applicant will also provide a contribution of £20,000 towards sustainable transport improvements within the town. Overall, we believe that this proposal will deliver extensive social, economic and environmental benefits for the local area and if approved, all 20 homes to be built to future home standards will become part of the council's housing stock, thereby making an important contribution to the provision of urgently needed affordable housing to meet local needs. We're pleased that the proposal has officer support and hope that you're able to support this in line with the officer recommendation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Members, uh, we'll now go to questions. Councillor Crizel. Thank you, Chair. Could I ask Mr Moss, um, the reasoning behind having the larger building at the front on the main road uh, rather than the smaller building? Uh, yeah. So Lower building, sorry. Yes, that's fine. Uh, so we, uh, we, we set the massing out to correspond to the, the context of the site. So the larger building was set closer to the commercial buildings uh, along the main road at the front as it's it's more proportionally balanced in its scale and then given the lack of buildings in the car park the the, the intention was to step the massing down towards the car park and the neighboring context with the smaller buildings and the lower eaves uh, facing number 41. How high how much higher are the front buildings to the commercial buildings next door? Uh, they're approximately two and a half to three metres, depending on the, uh, the roof. So the, the ones, two and a half to three metres to the, the ones at the back of the site. So the, the, to the neighbouring one next door, I think it's close to about four and a half to five metres. Yeah, that's my point. Thank you. Oh, the other thing is the zinc. Sorry, who do I ask that of? The zinc that's, that's supposed to be um, weathered. What colour does it come out at in the end then? It's, it's very close to slate, which is which was the intention of the decision. So it, it sort of uh, uh, references the slate and red brick buildings around uh, Totten, but obviously being zinc is, is much more durable and uh, beneficial for maintenance for the council. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bellows. Thank you. I'm not sure if this question's for you or not, actually. Um, so the... The, there are one and two bedroom flats which are going to be rented or affordable rents, yeah. Um, because they're one and two bedroom flats, are they going to, is there going to be any age restriction or is it going to be um, aimed at people over 50 or will there be a mixture because there's not going to be any facilities there for children as such? Just general question, really. Happy to answer that. And um, the flats to the front... The 12 in the main block are going to be general needs homes, one and two bedroom homes. Uh, and the block to the rear, it, the proposal at the moment is for single people, for temporary accommodation. For temporary accommodation before they're moved on. How many flats is that going to be? Eight. Eight, okay. Thank you. Councillor Kangaroo. Uh, thank you. I'm just looking at the page 45 on this, uh, slide 45. Uh, is the um, block A proposed? Um, I think it's minus 40, 43 probably. Yeah, 43 probably. Um, yeah, that one. I'm looking at the left side 
and I can see no windows on the left side of the block at all. And the natural light for the whole block seems to be from very small windows. Is that adequate natural light to get into that block? Given that we have got a large tree in the front of the blocks that block the light completely into the, this flat, is that point for concern? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there are roof lights um, along this side that would give light and ventilation to those flats. There's also windows to the front and rear, um, and they would meet um, lighting standards. And I, I appreciate your point about the tree being close at the front, and it's quite a tall, high tree, which would be retained. But the, the amount of light to those flats would be adequate. Okay. Uh, my next question is regarding... Um, affordable um, housing. Um, we just said the um, gentleman mentioned that only the eight block, uh, eight flats on the back, going to be temporary. Therefore, it can't be affordable. And since we don't have any um, uh, in, any any, uh, we don't know what is affordable means. Who's there is no kind of level. Uh, imposed by the council to say uh, the rent would be 20% less than the uh, going rate in the area because we don't have any, any, any level on that. How do, how do we know that is going to be affordable? The scheme is going to be supported with funding from Homes England and will be bidding for capital funding. They have two tenure models. They have an affordable rent model, which is a maximum of 80% of market rent. And to secure their funding, we would have to commit to that. The other option is social rent, which is very akin, if you like, to council rents that we're currently charging our tenants, which is more on the lines of 55%. But it's a funding condition from Homes England that we stick to those rent levels. So there is certainty there that they will be maintained. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, Kangaroni, Councillor Kangaroni has answered my question on the windows at the side. Uh, the car parking is non-existent. Um, how far is it to that car park that's on, on the plan somewhere? How far is it to walk or get to it if you do have a car? <laughs> That car park's right at the back of the site, the Westfield car park. Is that the Is one? there access through so they can get through to there? there or have be, they got to walk all the way around? Yeah, there will be an access through because the units in block B are walk up units, so you can get from those to the car park and then anyone else will be able to walk around either through the central amenity area or That's the good. longer way if they want to. Thank you. And also, is there access anywhere in these buildings for anyone that has got a, a mobility scooter or anything like that? Yes, I think all of the uh, ground floor flats are level access, so they are accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the design's very nice, by the way. Councillor Benison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. My question is for Mr Davis, please. Um, the introduction of these flats, will that be reducing the council's use of uh, bed and breakfast? Yes, is the answer. The temporary accommodation in particular. Yeah. Um, the general needs, the 12 homes at the front will be general needs going to people from the council's housing, sorry, to going to people from the council's housing register. The eight temporary accommodation homes, uh, yes, very much is being delivered yeah. to address the, the, the use of bed the and breakfast. The use of bed and breakfast. Correct. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Um, I just wondered on the plan, the I couldn't work out what were the windows that were facing the bungalow and whether they were living room windows or not and whether that was going to cause lots of overlooking into that person's garden. If I could just point out that this is the side facing, the west side facing that the bungalow at number 41. This is the first floor. This is flat 13, this one here where I've got my pointer. The larger window here would serve a living room. 
um, but there would also be a window on the front serving the same living room. Um, that window has the most direct relationship with that particular bungalow and so is conditioned to be obscurely glazed. It is, okay. Um, the other windows are set back relative to that property and, and having been to visit that particular property, um, satisfied that the overlooking would be acceptable given that it's across the access road. Um, the, the roof lights at, at the top that, that I referred to previously in a previous question would, would look over the, over the top, so yeah. again, um, no, no overlooking would result. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's also, car parking has been mentioned. I just wondered, who does the council own that car park or is it a private car park? It is a council it's owned a council car, car park. park. So is there anything that would be given to those tenants for like free parking? Because it's mentioned by the Totten councillor that um, wants to refuse this application that many people park in the roads all around there to avoid that car park um, charges. So I'm just concerned it's going to cause more congestion around that area. The answer to that is that um, there are uh, long-term car parking clocks which are available. Um, now, that is certainly going to be an option for tenants if they do have vehicles, that they can actually purchase one of those clocks from the council. Um, there are, there's no firm plan at the moment for the council to provide those clocks as part of rent, but it is an option for them to actually purchase. Thank you. Councillor Servier. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. It's just that as we're, this is being um, broadcast, I think it'd be quite nice if you talked us through some of the, what one would call the decent home standards and the green issues that we, that need to be addressed in the building of these flats. That would be very nice. Thank you. Yeah, happy to field on that one. The scheme, uh, as is, is we're committed to in, in the details that have come forward, is to be future home standard. So that standard is uh, a proposed standard that's coming in, in, we think, 2025. We're actually looking to build to that standard. It's a gas-free standard. It will be all electric. Um, it involves uh, the provision, the, the, the construction involves the additional provision of insulation and will make a significant, uh, and with that and with air source heat pump heating, will make a significant difference to the cost of actually heating and, and running the homes in question. So we are, we are committing to that standard before that comes in, in through building regulations. I think the, we touched on the parking. Uh, I, 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 I live in Totten, I've got business in Totten as well. I know how parking works. And if the applicant, uh, if the occupier of these buildings apply for the clock, which means they can occupy the parking space, which is for public use, 24-7, it means they're going to reduce the number of parking available to the shoppers coming to the town. Therefore, uh, the space will be taken by the residents. It, it, don't you think it has a problem? Uh, I know we have got quite a few park up in Totten. But obviously, we are taking away some of the car parks, which is convenient for the people who shops from the, the, the precinct area. Uh, uh, do you think that is not having a parking allocation for the building is a cause problem? I think it's worth pointing out that we are looking at these as being rented homes. When the homes are actually advertised under our choice-based letting scheme, they will be advertised that they don't provide or include parking. So from the outset, the people who are bidding to secure those homes and to live in them are going to be going in on the expectation of, of it being a, a car-free scheme. Uh, but as anybody who lives in Totten or our district can purchase a parking clock, they will have the option, they will have the prerogative to buy a clock. With the eight temporary accommodation homes, I think it, we are anticipating it's very unlikely that those people who require temporary accommodation are going to be in the position to run cars as well in, in reality. And of course those people will be moving on to permanent accommodation in other places. So um, yes, we're talking about unknowns here, but I think the impact, the likely impact on Westfield car park is, is going to be very small. Just to, can I ask another question if I may? That's regarding the um, neighbourhood plan and Totten Centre regeneration. <coughs> 
have to get, take that in consideration when we actually look into that. In the, obviously, this is not happening today, but is that going to fill within that? <coughs> That's for officer, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. I can quickly come back on that, Chair. Um, as you know, the, the neighbourhood plan is very much in its infancy at the moment and doesn't carry any weight. Um, what I can say is, that, which was also linked to the parking issue, is that the Hampshire County Council have put in place this walking strategy, as you know, for Totten to try and reduce the reliance on private motor vehicles. So this develop the developer will have to pay a contribution towards improving pedestrian links from this site into the town centre, thereby in, in the long term reducing the, the need for a car. Uh, sorry, we know that uh, developer contribution doesn't normally doesn't necessarily get used for the local use. That was a big part and that part can be spent anywhere. Could you be guaranteed that money get be used in Totten rather than going somewhere else? Yes, yeah, yeah, the section 106 will, it's for a certain project, which is pedestrianisation along Salisbury Road. So yeah, it's, it's defined for that purpose. Thank you. I have two more questions and then we'll go into debate. So, Councillor Crizel. Sorry, I probably should know this, but the parking clocks, I understood, did not let you park overnight and we have no overnight parking in Totten. And given that lots of low-paid people are now running around in vans, where are they supposed to put the vans? Because there's nowhere to park. Are they okay to use overnight for a parking clock? The parking clocks allow 20 out of 24 hours, is, is my recollection of that. I, I'm not sure if that's defined as overnight or not, but it is the reality there that if you park in the car park, it will be a case of having to move your car on a... On a, on a uh, frequent basis. But I, I think I would go back to my earlier answer, which is we are taking steps to reduce the likelihood of residents having cars and needing the car parking facility in the first place. The last question, Councillor Hall. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got two points. One is, is there any solar heating, solar pan panels on those on that building so that they can take advantage of the sun? Uh, those were not included on the scheme. So when we were designing it, we did a uh, viability assessment for a range of energy solutions for the building. And though we, we came to the conclusion that the air source heat pump would provide a sufficient amount of heating to mean that the solar panels were not necessary. But there's televisions to run, cookers to run, lights to burn, still needs energy, and those heat pumps won't really, like, do that, will they? Question? Do you have another question? Yes, my other question is, um, it's nice of Hampshire Council to say that they won't be, you know, going to stop the use of cars, but surely that's against people's choice you're telling people they can't have a car. Now that, to me, is a bit of a dictatorship. I think we've covered this already. No, we, we have, haven't. We have, uh, we we have had an answer. Listen, I've can't, asked you the question. Can't. Yeah, but the question's already been asked and we've already had an answer. No, we haven't. We've all <laughs> have we haven't a had different a, answer. We haven't had an answer. Why? <laughs> We're not set when nobody's saying, I believe, that the residents can't have a car, it's just that they won't have allocated parking for them, as with many developments or existing housing stock within all of our towns and villages. Um, Totten is seen as one of our most sustainable locations in terms of you know, the train and everything else, employment opportunities. So it's, our policy allows for zero parking where we think is appropriate. Okay, we're now going to debate. Councillor Rickman. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I sit and listen to a lot of criticism of, of uh, an application that, by gum, we need badly. Debating whether people got a car or not, as these are homes for people. I got quoted a couple of years ago of saying about, I want a new council estate in every new forest village because of right to buy. So many of those houses have been lost to our communities. I'd like this application, every urban area in the new forest, to, to actually close the gap. So, hooray, I support it 100%. Propose its permission, Chairman. <laughs> right, I'm sport for choice. Second, again, Count Corbridge.
Councillor Benes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for me, um, this is a, a, a question of these flats will reduce our dependency on temporary bed and breakfast, which is costing this council a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money. Um, and I think that's important that we are able to provide accommodation of this uh, standard, this calibre, dare I say, um, for people to get out of bed and breakfast and into you know, one and two bedroom um, flats, which are sorely needed. Um, as regards the parking issue, it's going to be quite clear that anybody living or, or seeking to live in one of these is going to have buses, trains, the ability to walk to shops. They're not going to have a car or have a need of a car. There are a lot of people actually who don't have cars, believe it or not. Some of us actually are reliant on cars, but there are some that, that are not. Um, so the, the parking issue is, is not an issue for me at all. Um, I like the design of it. I like the way it's, it's been designed with um, different shapes to the roofs, which break up the, the bulk. Um, and what more can I say? It is sorely needed. Um, so I most definitely will be voting in favour of this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Sevio. I think uh, my colleague in front of me had her hand up before me, so I'll go after. Do you want to go, Kate? Yeah, you go. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to point out that in the past, I've sat here quite a few times in the leafy suburbs where people say we should listen to the local council's remarks and the whole planning department said in Totten that they weren't happy with this, mainly because of the parking and we're not allowed to argue about the parking because we're in a sustainable site apparently. The trouble is that we are at chock-a-block of people parking on roads now. It's a bit like when um, Limington kept complaining about their old people homes and the fact they had too many. Well, we've got too many people parking on roads because we've had lots of um, planning coming through Totten lately, which have added on to small flats on top of shops, etc., where there's been no parking. I have a problem because I'm on the housing committee and I really, really want this building. Um, and all of you could have this building in your areas if you'd like, and we'll, we'll, we'll let you have it. But um, on, the, on the side of parking, it really is an issue in Totten. I'm sorry, but it is. If you lived there, you would know that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sevier. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, yeah, I have to agree with um, some of my other councillors that these are places for people. And not all people, as Councillor Benison said, have cars. They don't want a car. And I'm that, um, that they won't po have possible uh, parking for a car. And we do have a lot of, lot of those sort of flats around the, around the area. So we do need these homes. And uh, um, so I'm very much in, in favour of it. But uh, as I say, not everybody has a car. And, uh, and somewhere that they can just get on the go to work in Southampton or somewhere, this would be absolutely excellent. If they're not disabled, because... The people we need to house are, are, are the people that are less are, are more disadvantaged, and and cannot always work or cannot always do things because of different different um, circumstances. So we we need to be helping people, uh, and this is what we this was this is what we need. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Wade. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, we. I don't wish to repeat what's already said, but we really do need these properties. Now, I know this site very well. Um, within 150 metres, there are three car parks. You know, so if somebody wanted to park their car, it's not an arduous task to, to have a clock or whatever and walk to it. They're very well designed. It, it, it's, we have to look at putting affordable housing in strategic locations with public transport, infrastructure around its shops. That site ticks every one of those boxes. And it's ideal, there are, and, and there are many people who, who, who probably for various economic reasons haven't got a car, and this is ideal form because there's so much public transport. I, I agree with a lot of the points that Councillor Rickman said, we need these properties, so I fully support this application. Thank you. Councillor Bellows. <coughs> Yeah, basically, I think now everyone said what I was going to say. 
Um, which is that we do need these. We're desperate for one and, and two bedroomed uh, properties. And uh, the location is good because what's there at the moment is a bit of an eyesore. So these are going to look nice. As for the, um, the vehicles and the parking, I mean, there will be people that are desperate for housing. So whether they've got a car, they will go for this. Um, but it's just... Um, you know, people will just have to make the effort then to go to the car parks. And that is the problem. They don't. That's why they park in the roads. But we need this and I will support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Corbridge. Um, again, I mean, most of it's been said already. I think this is a very nice design. It's very, very much needed, as, as my colleagues have said. I think the whole thing about parking, yeah, of course, it's going to be an issue. Um, but as Tim says, it's, we, we operate choice-based letting, so people will know what they're, um, what they're going to get. Um, and it's not impossible. But I think that it really is a credit to this council that we're building such properties with all the sustainable and environmentally friendly additions, um, and I welcome it wholeheartedly. Thank you. We have two more people that wish to speak. Um, Councillor Brand. Thank you. Um, I agree with what everybody said about we all want affordable housing, um, but we also don't want to impact people that live in these areas as well. Um, so I just wonder if we could perhaps do a study once these have been built and people move in as to how many people actually have cars that move into there because then that will help us form our decisions going forward. Because at the moment, we're just guessing. People won't have cars, or they will have cars. They might have cars, but not have £140 a year to spend on a car park per space. You know, we, if we could do some investigation as to how they're actually used, and then we can help those people and build better in the future. Councillor Hopkins. I think it's a lovely design. I'm, I'm all for it. The only thing I think of is Totten should get together and find more car parks before you design any more properties, get more parking spaces and get them off the roads. That's my only bug. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that brings the debate to an end. Um, we do have um, a proposal by Councillor Rickman to accept the recommendation and that's been seconded by Councillor Corbridge. But I'll now go back to Mr Tim Davis. You have one minute to respond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. But I don't think I have anything to say. But thank you very much indeed. Good debate. Thank you. In that case, we'll go to the vote. So all of those in favour, please raise your hand. Against? That has been granted. Thank you very much. That concludes the meeting. Thank you all very much. Before you leave, before